Thank you, Graham. I appreciate those, those comments, many of which were true. <laughs> Except for the part about the Maine native. I, you know, you're always asked if you're from Maine, and I always have to admit that, no, I've only lived here 35 years, so I am, I am not from Maine. But, and another piece I want to put in there is that in the mid-80s, I actually worked at Bigelow Lab, so I, I have some, some experience having gone through some of these things uh, back in the old days on McAllen Point uh, in, the, in the buildings where the breezes were, were quite free. <laughs> and I do want to thank uh, Graham and, and Darlene and, uh, and Valerie. I, I don't know if Valerie's here, but, but thanks very much for, for uh, having set this up. And I was hoping that you would have a chance to see some of the things that Bigelow scientists look at. David Fields has, has very graciously done a tow for us out in, uh, in Booth Bay Harbor Harbor and has uh, found some, some creatures that, that I think are, are pretty interesting for us. And if you have never seen what it is they do at Bigelow, there is an opportunity, I think, coming up this week. I'm sure Graham will talk about and, and next week. But, but to actually see the organisms live is, is a lot of fun. And to, and to think about what these things are. And David did a tow, so he will get any number of things. When I worked at Bigelow, I worked strictly in the culture collection for phytoplankton. So dealing only with the single cell plants, in essence. Uh, Barney and Patty can tell me that they aren't really plants, but I think of them as plants that photosynthesize, that do everything we do, but are a single cell. It, it's really a phenomenal little beast. Uh, and there are thousands of these clones. And th there could be one now. Was that one, Dave? Yeah, there was one. <laughs> they're, they're quite shy as well. So these things do come in, a, in a, an astonishing variety of sizes and shapes and, and mobility and, and mechanisms for them to be able to be up in the water column because they do photosynthesize. So they need light and they need to figure a way to stay up in that light area so they can, so they can create their own energy. As, uh, as, as Graham mentioned, you know, one thing, these single cell organisms are, are about 10 to the minus 6 meters. Actually, they're more like 10 to the minus 5, but let's go with 10 to the minus 6. So that's a micron. That's a micro. That's, a, that's the unit of measure. And that minus 6 is an order of magnitude. So Bloom, Bigelow Lab, orders of magnitude, helps, hopefully, begins to work with students, and we have some some uh, Bloom alumni up here who, who can talk about that, but begins to focus on what are these different orders of magnitude that we operate at. So we've got 10 to the minus 6 for some of these single cell creatures. A human hair is about 10 to the minus 6. When these things bloom in the spring, because the nutrients are there, the water has been churned up by the spring storms, the, the sunlight is increasing, there can be approximately 3,000 cells per milliliter. So 3 times 10 to the third. Again, order of magnitude. So now, as, as students are dealing with mathematics in school, it now begins to make some sense to them to think about, well, these, these exponents really mean something. They have, they have a, a value for me in thinking about how far from that zero point or that one point is this thing. If it's minus 6, it's, it's quite small. If it's three, that's, that's not too bad. That's, that's quite a bit. But remember, that's 3,000 cells per milliliter. So, so that's, while that seems like a lot, a milliliter is about a, a quarter of a teaspoon. So it's, it's a lot of cells, but again, in not much, in not much territory. Any, any other little creatures there we can see? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 steal away. I'm told that, that people, one of the things my, my better half, Sue Allen, studies informal science learning, which is these kind of events, museums, planetariums, those, those zoos, aquariums, and 
people really flock to live animals, live plants, live, live things much more than, than videos. So, so I asked David if he could find me some good cultures or take a good, a good toe and show you some of these things that you might never have seen before. And some of these, you know, some of these creatures are pretty important because they, they can create uh, paralytic shellfish poisoning. They can, they can, uh, is that one? That's a dino? So, so they're, you know, these, these things, this is what I know probably you, many of you are not old enough to remember, but there was a U-2 was shot down over Russia and the pilot was, was captured. He actually had a pill that he was supposed to take that I am told was made of toxins from these organisms. But, but you know, I guess the choice is prison or dying and maybe prison is a, is a better deal. At least that's what I would think. So David's going to keep showing you some things, but I want to I want to ask you some questions. This, I, I've I've been to a few of these, and I, I and I want to get a sense of what what happens with this. So so I'm going to ask you, first of all, how many of you are at a Bigelow Science Cafe for the first time ever? Oh, nice. How about, how about this is the second, or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a regular, I, I come to these a lot. Oh, Shewer, well, that's interesting. What made you think to come to, no, no, that's a different question. <laughs> how many of you were here for Clarice Yench's talk about, you know, the origins of Bigelow and, and how that all started and the houseboat and all that? Yeah, good, good. And then, we're here for Barney's summer vacation video that he showed all those. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, Barney was here, good, good. How many of you have been to open houses or other events at Bigelow proper in East Boothway? Oh, that's a good number. Good, great. And uh, how many of you have ever had a one week or a longer experience during high school with a, with a summer opportunity outside of school, where you leave school for a week or more to do science. Oh, good. Excellent. Good. Well, then you can take over the talk. <laughs> Great. Well, what I, uh, what I want to talk about is I'm going to talk a little bit more about Bloom, a little bit about mentoring, have our two Bloom alums talk about their experiences hear from you about your experiences, about mentoring, about these programs, those kinds of things, and, and then we can, we can get into other topics as, as they come up. So I, I want to I talk a little bit about the, the orders of magnitude program, and Bloom, ironically, or, or maybe by design, you know, spring Bloom is very important to Bigelow scientists. That's, that's the key time when there's lots going on, biologically, physically, uh, chemically, and, and things are coming together, getting all mixed up, a lot of uh, uh, energy usage, a lot of oxygen production, so Bloom fits rather well with, with what this program was about, in addition to the, the fact that the orders of magnitude is an important concept within science. But this all began in uh, 1989, and it began with, with a conversation with, with Jim McLaughlin, Clarice Jentsch and, and Maureen Keller. And I, can, I wasn't there, but I can just imagine. And Clarice would, would probably say, you know, what do you think about if we did something like, and then Maureen would say, you know, if we added in this piece, and then Jim would say, you know, if we did that, I bet we could get it funded. I mean, I, I could just see them sitting around making this, this come together. And it actually grew out of, back in the old, old days when, when Bigelow was at McCowan Point, they used to have a one day, you know, community come in, do a, do a tow, do, do those kinds of things, have, have fun, go through the labs, look through microscopes, look at the various instrumentation, and, and, uh, and get, get involvement that way. And these people said, you know, that's good, but what we really want to do is figure out how to, how to get this to the next generation. So this idea then spread to how do we get each county in the state 
there are 16 counties in the state of Maine. How do we get participation from each of those counties in some kind of event that, that will pique kids' interest in, in what we do and, and work with them in science? So they, they decided to uh, put together a program when, you know, it's a little bit after the spring bloom, but it's really before summer gets real busy. So sometime in May, they bring kids together for this, for this opportunity in, uh, in, at, at Bigelow. The interesting thing is that, well, one of the interesting things is that this is, this is all locally funded. It's, it's you folks that have been supporting this thing for 25 years. So it's, it's an amazing testament to, to Bigelow that they've endured, to you that you continue to, to do it, and, and that students keep, keep coming to it because they, they have found it to be useful, and there, there is now a little network of them telling, telling aspiring juniors, because we, we choose kids from their junior year to come to this. But there's also a, a critical piece in here that, that we need to never lose sight of, and, and students especially need to know this, is that it's absolutely critical that the scientists be involved, but as well, if that support structure is not in place within the system, it's not gonna happen. So, so people like Vicki Renicki, who, who elected not to address the crowd tonight, but has played an instrumental role at Bigelow for years and years, Pat Boisvert, Fran Scannell, Kathy Cucci, Terry Cucci, Jeff Brown, Ellen Hogan. I mean, the list goes on and on. These aren't the senior scientists, but without them, this program would not happen. And sometimes they don't, they don't get the recognition they, they deserve, but, but we, as, as students and aspiring scientists, need to recognize that they are absolutely critical to this whole thing. As well, David Field has led this program, David Fields has led this program, and Nicole Poulton, who should actually be doing this, but is unfortunately out on a cruise at this time and uh, was in, unable to be here. So, so here's what Bloom does. It requires a high school junior to first find out about the program. You know, sometimes it's hard to reach kids in schools because you don't have their email address and, and some teachers transmit information and some don't want to lose kids in May because it's AP time and you know, we're going to miss a week of my course and so I'm, I'm, so kids have to find out about that. And then they have to fill out a pretty extensive application. And that's, you know, with, with recommendations and all that kind of thing and it's, 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 a, it's another step. And then they have to be selected because, you know, we can only take 16 to this. And then they have to find a way to get to Booth Bay Harbor. Now, you know, it, it's five and a half hours from Fort Kent to here. So, so it's a long way for those kids from Arista County. And then they have to put up with 15 kids they've never seen before. And they, and they have to begin to figure out, you know, how am I going to work with these kids? Because they then go out on a cruise and they gather, sample, they gather samples and they, and they use equipment they've never seen before. And they, to, to do the sampling, and then they use equipment they've never seen before to analyze the data. And then they work in teams with people they've never met before to analyze the data and, and prepare a presentation to give before some of the world's best oceanographers on ocean science. I mean, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, difficult thing to do, and, and they have to do this in, in four and a half days. So it's, it's a testament that, they've, that they survive it at all. So what I would like is for, for Leanne and, and Breyer to introduce themselves, talk about their experiences with the Bloom program, uh, give you some, some understanding of what it has done to them in a good way, <laughs> and, and, uh, and to think about you know, other ways that they have been involved with, with either mentoring through Bloom or, or uh, uh, where their career trajectory is going including what high schools you're from, because you're, you're both Maine kids, right? Good. Leanne? So my name is Leanne Whitney, and I am currently a postdoc at Bigelow Laboratory. So my story kind of comes full circle. So I grew up in a small town in Washington County. Um, actually, all towns in Washington County are small. 
if you've ever been there. So I grew up in Machias. That's the area that I grew up in. My graduating high school class had about 30 kids. That's erring on the side of being a little bit higher. Um, so I've always been a science junkie. I've been a science nerd since a little kid. Not necessarily marine science, but I am always found it to be a really interesting subject matter. So in high school, I took as many science classes as I possibly could. So by my junior year in high school, I had sort of exhausted my options. And those classes are your basic classes, biology, chemistry, physics. There were no um, sort of more focused type classes. And so um, the, my um, biology teacher announced that there was a Keller Bloom program that was available and she pulled me aside and strongly recommended for me to apply this, to apply for this program, saying that it'd be really great for me to get these sort of more specialized experiences. So I applied and was clearly um, selected. And I would say that that um, I mean, changed my life is a little dramatic, but it certainly was what sparked my interest in marine science. So until the Keller program, I had never seen what um, an ocean sample looked like under the microscope. So, you know, seeing these images for the first time happened for me my junior year in high school at the Keller Bloom program. And I was just amazed to learn about the diversity in shapes and sizes, how important these tiny little bugs are. Um, I, had no, I had no idea. And so I would think that that was a really um, altering experience for me to learn about these important bugs. I would say another valuable lesson, and probably the most valuable lesson I learned out of the Keller Bloom program, was that this was um, an accessible option as a career. I think sometimes people have a tendency to put scientists on a pedestal, perhaps from watching TV or movies or different shows. And so working with scientists closely and using the types of instruments that they use every day and realizing that this is you know, something that everyone can do, um, I think was really one of the more valuable lessons. And so after the Bloom program, I worked with that same um, high school biology teacher and developed an independent study. And so my senior year, I took a marine biology program as an independent study and then went to the University of Maine for um, uh, to get my bachelor's in marine science and then pursued my PhD at the University of Rhode Island where I got my PhD in cellular and molecular biology and came to the Bigelow family in 2013 where I've been as a postdoc, a postdoctoral researcher since then. And it's been a really um, great experience. I never, I feel like the luckiest person in the world sometimes to be back in the state that I love working at a great institution and have had the experience of actually mentoring Bigelow students um, last year for the 2013 class. So that was really great. And I hope that I brought to them those lessons that I learned, which you know, were that this is fun and exciting and why I find it fun and exciting and trying to convey to them that what we do with them as students isn't the watered down science. This is what we do every, every day. And so I hope that I've conveyed those same messages as a mentor. Great. So I will pass it on to Briar now to talk about his experiences. Oh, hi, I'm Briar Bragdon. I'm from Windsor. I went to high school at Haldale High School, and I was interested in marine science specifically ever since I can remember. I grew up on the water. Uh, my parents took me to the beach every day when I was little, so that really got me interested in what the ocean was like and what was going on. In fact, my first words were lava a cab, which was supposed to be lobster trap. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then as uh, I continued on into high school, I started taking all the science classes I possibly could. In fact, by my senior year, I took every science class and I had to go to a different high school to take AP biology because we didn't offer it. Um, and then my junior year, was when my advisor came to me and they um, told me that they got a <clears throat> an email about the Keller Bloom program. And she said that she knew that I was very interested in marine science because by now I was volunteering at the Maine State Aquarium for three years and I always talk about all of the animals that we had there and I would, I would be teaching my advisor about things and then she would, she would tease me because I would not let her say sea star, I'd always, I mean starfish. She could not say starfish around me or I'd get really mad because they're not starfish, they're sea stars. Um, 
So she turned me on to the Keller Bloom program. But at first, I didn't know if I was going to apply or not because previously I shadowed a, an, an oceanographer at um, a university. And he was doing, I don't even remember what it was now, but it was something with um, satellite imagery and phytoplankton, and I was bored out of my mind. <laughs> so I didn't even know if I wanted to even go to this program. But then um, at the last minute, I decided, oh, why not? I'll apply. So I applied, I got in, and then um, I went, and it was an eye-opening experience. It completely changed my view of oceanography. Um, like seeing the different kinds of animals and how small they are and they can do this, they can do that, they can do everything that the bigger animals can but on a more microscopic scale and, um, and then I never thought that I'd be able to stare at bacterium for like hours and be interested <laughs> in it but <laughs> um, so then after that uh, after I fin uh, graduated from the Bloom program in 2012 um, I started looking more about oceanography, trying to figure out more about it. And, um, and now I'm going to the University of New England and um, I've done different research with different professors. Um, one pr professor that I did research with was with Dr. Zeman and he, we were looking at um, how to do chlorophyll samples and looking at different chlorophylls and light spectrometry, spectrometry and things like that. Um, another thing that I probably never would have thought of doing ever if it wasn't for the Bloom program. And um, recently, um, I've, another thing with the Bloom program that opened my eyes was not to shut something down automatically just because of one experience. So this past year, I did a research project about um, sediments. And sediments also was one of the, another one of those things that I didn't think I'd ever get into. And it was kind of interesting seeing how the sediments would flow through different rivers. And then I ended up presenting a poster project um, at a NEARS conference in Massachusetts. So that was a lot of fun. But <clears throat> it's really interesting to see how now my paths have changed because of the Bloom program. Um, it definitely hasn't changed with marine science, but looking at different aspects of marine science has definitely changed because of the Bloom program. Great, thanks, Rick. <laughs> so if you do the math, we have 25 years times 16 students, so that's 400. So the other 398 are just about to come out. And <laughs> but before they do, are there, are there particular questions? Because you've, you've got the, the spectrum here. Clearly, Leanne is, is gone through the program and then went back to school and then through university and through grad school and, and Breyer now is heading down that path. Any questions you might have for these folks about their, about Bloom, their experience, what it's like being a, 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 a woman scientist, what's it like in the, in the, in the field in general? Yes, question down here. Sure. So the question was, would there be, an, you know, would students that are not necessarily interested in science benefit from the Bloom program? And so my answer to that would be absolutely yes. So as um, a postdoc at, at Bigelow, I've participated in the selection committee for the Bloom students. And we actually look for students that um, are, are honest and maybe, you know, say that, like, I'm, you know, not sure that science is for me or is for marine science or, or perhaps for more um, from the inland counties that um, maybe have never even seen the ocean before. And so I think that we, you know, we look for that and I think that any student, regardless of, you know, if they know what their career path is, could benefit from it because it's so hands-on and it's an experience that I had never had before and I had had, you know, an environmental science interest from the beginning, like going out on a boat 
was, um, was new for me. I didn't know that I got seasick until I went on, on the cruise that the Bloom program offered. So I would encourage any and all students with any interest to apply for it, because I'm sure that they've never had it before. And whether they continue in the marine science program or not, I'm sure that they would get something out of it. Even being away from home for the first time, it's scary. Like that's, you know, I don't remember specific details, but I remember being um, scared and leaving my, the comfort zone for the first time, like no friends, no family. But then you, that in and of itself is an experience and you realize that everyone's in this same boat for you know, lack of a better word. And um, you, know, they're, uh, you know, everyone was out of their comfort zone. So that, that brings you together. So there's an experience for everyone. Um, yeah, I also completely agree because just like with my experience, even though I was so interested in science, oceanography was that part of science that I didn't think I'd ever be interested in, and then this made me interested in it. So I think definitely a similar thing is that if not interested in science in general, it could definitely turn somebody on to being interested in science. We, we have, or, or Graham has, or somebody has uh, done evaluations of the Bloom program, and so we beginning to track these students because you know, some of them are now postdocs, so it, it's pretty interesting to see what has happened to them along the route. But some of the quotes are quite interesting because some of the students find that they don't want to be ocean scientists as a result of this program, and that's not a bad thing either. Another thing is that there are lots of opportunities, sorry Graham, in other fields across the state, you know, in, in genetics or in agriculture or in, in, in bioplastics or in, in biotechnology that are similar kinds of programs, not to the extent that this is, but, but for a student to express interest, go with that interest, you know, find out what it is that, that she's passionate about and feed that because it, it might turn into something, it might not, but but clearly, if they're, if they're passionate about it, go with it. Did you want to add anything? Is there another question? Yes? What kind of outreach does Bloom do in terms of going to high schools in Maine or other states to try to you know, pop this up where you might be able to get some of these kids who aren't really engaged in trying to you know, interest? Yeah. Did I mention this was locally funded? <laughs> Uh, you know, the best outreach are the kids when they get back to school because they've got their whole senior year to, to infect others. And, and so that word of mouth is absolutely critical. What we try to do is to, through various email lists and through past alums, pump the information out there. But, but it's hard to reach kids sometimes. And as I say, this is about the time that, that AP tests are given. And, teachers are reluctant to let their kids go because they might miss out on the AP test or the final cram for AP or, you know, there's, there's lots of reasons not to do it. And, and we, we have to figure out the incentives to do it. And, you know, this is great incentive here. Yes. So the question is, is the group that comes each year spread across all counties? That's the goal, is to have one from each of the 16 counties. Now some years we don't get kids, and we don't get kids from specific counties, so we might have to take a couple from a county just because you, you, know, you dance with who brung you. you, you play with who wants to play. And so if you don't hear anything from X county, but you've got two really good candidates from Y County, yeah, you know, you, you, you have to do it. Uh, do you have a better answer? Okay. Yes? Is there a website that talks about the program? Is there a website that talks about the program? We, we have the tattoo later. You can get it <laughs> right out here. It's, yes, there, there's, I mean, the, if you haven't been to the Bigelow website, it's, it's quite full of information. And just click on education, and it'll kick you into, into both. Well, there's, there's the, the Keller Bloom program, and I did want to mention that one of Maureen's brothers is here tonight, so I, I want to recognize uh, Emmett and, and his wife, Anne, and their, and their daughter, uh, Christy, is here as well. So there's the Keller Bloom program, which is this week-long extravaganza, you know, feeding 16 kids, keeping, keeping them separate when they're supposed to be separate, keeping, <laughs> you know, all those kinds of issues. So that's a, a week of fun. 
And then there's also a uh, Keller scholarship that has been set up by, uh, after, after Maureen died, uh, there was a scholarship put up. And this year, I think we were able to award two scholarships. So, so trying to keep kids interested in science, absolutely. Other questions? Yes. So the question is, when you go back after you've survived the week in May, do you, do you have an opportunity to address your other students in a formal or informal way? Um, well, <clears throat> from what I was hearing, it would depend on the school. My school, I did. I did a presentation with my chemistry class because I was in AP chemistry that year. And part of the thing was that I was going to do a presentation in order for me to go. And um, so I did a presentation, and I got a grade on the presentation and everything. Um, but that also helped with other um, people to know about the program. But I also heard that one person that was in my program my year was that their school was requiring that after she came back that she was going to have to do a whole presentation to the whole entire school about what she did there. So I think it would depend on the school, but it definitely does happen. Wait, wait what is this, David? Uh, polychaete. The larval polychaete worm. It'll settle often at the bottom and live in the sediment. But they start out their life in the plankton. Oh, so it's an animal. We don't care about those. <laughs> but if you look inside its gut, you can see the orange, and that's all phytoplankton. So there is some phytoplankton. <laughs> <laughs> Leah? So my experiences were very, were very similar. I had to come back to my high school and to my biology class and give a presentation on what I had, what I had learned and what my experiences were, sort of in exchange for missing a week of classes. It was a good, good deal. <laughs> right. A week of classes, that is a tough, tough price to pay. Other, other questions for our, our alums. They don't like to be called bloomers, by the way. I made that mistake <laughs> once, so I won't do that again. But yes, sir. What's the tuition for this program? What's the tuition for this program? It's pretty steep this year. It's a, it's a zero. I mean, there's no cost to the student whatsoever. The, the cost is getting to Booth Bay Harbor and getting home. That's, that's really the cost. And for, you know, Booth Bay Harbor kids or Lincoln Academy kids, that's pretty cheap. But, but those kids from Jackman or, or Fort Kent, they, they pay a price. I mean, it's, it's a long way. But, you know, for, for many of these kids, as, as Leanne said, even though they're within, you know, an hour of the coast, lots of these kids have never seen the ocean. And they just don't have that opportunity. And so this is a tremendous, tremendous opportunity to learn that you can be seasick with 16 other kids on a boat. So that's, that's a learning. Yes? Um, Leanne mentioned that um, something about this, it's not watered down science, it's the real science and the cutting edge science. And I'm thinking about how, how every kid in this place has had this experience, but there's only one big alone left. That's a really great, so the question was for those, there's only one Bigelow lab, and so how do you expose all students to um, the, the real non-watered down science? And so, you know, that's a really great question, and I think that that's um, a problem for all, all educators to try to um, combat. Um, you know, my suggestions would be, you know, I went to a really small school and I was lucky enough, you know, those experiences weren't going to happen in the classroom. It just wasn't a possibility. And so I was lucky enough to have this experience, but there are other ways of getting them. You know, I think um, it's making the most of your situation. So it, same for me in, in undergrad, you know, I went to University of Maine. It's a very large school, especially coming from a graduating class of 30 kids. And so taking advantage of any opportunity that, that you are given, that's really the best advice that, that I could give. Um, and there's a lot you can do in, in your own back, backyard. You know, if there truly is an interest, the, you know, Google's a great resource and there's lots of um, sort of homegrown science that you can do. It's not necessarily the, you know, the non-watered down version, but there's a way to, to educate yourself. But really, I think it's about, um, seeking out whatever opportunities are, are available. Um, 
Um, well, I also, I think that is a really big challenge now with a lot of the education is the fact of that. So um, one thing that I have been doing trying to help with that is I, I've created my own program as a senior capstone project that I did uh, last, uh, t last year. And uh, it was, it's called Main Ocean in Motion. And what I did was I took uh, different animals um, to, into, into classrooms and taught them about it. And it wasn't necessarily the strict actual science that was happening, but at least got a little bit more of difference than what they were seeing in their own classroom and um, getting good responses from that. So just things like that, like she was saying, um, just taking advantage of anything that you can c come across. Great. Any other burning questions out there? Sure. Yeah, I'm interested to know how, what's the percentage of female scientists kind of starting, you know, at your level and postdoc, and if you see a drop off as people get more experience, and what do you think the reasons for that are? So the question is about the, the attrition of female scientists from, from undergraduate to postdoc and beyond. I don't know the statistics or the numbers off the top of my head, but that is certainly a trend that, that you see, that um, as you progress in you know, your education or your career, there's far fewer women. I would say that trend is changing. Um, the, you know, the classes that I took at the University of Maine in Marine Science program were taught predominantly by, by men. I can think of very few women who taught the classes. But by the time um, I started my PhD and throughout my PhD, I was in a lab dominated by women. Um, and this is, um, and all of my collaborators were, were women. Just by, by chance, I think it's just, just showing a, um, a shift in, in the trend. Um, so I think that it, that it is changing. I think that it can be, you know, it's a demanding um, career choice, but there's a way to make it work. So I, I hope that more and more people are, are seeing that. Um, and I think that that, that trend is, is changing. So for example, I had applied for a fellowship last year and it was um, a fellowship that was geared towards working with underrepresented groups. And at that time, women were included as an underrepresented group in the ocean sciences. And I applied for it again this year and women were no longer considered. So I think that's showing you that there is a shift in, in, the, in the trend. The, the research that I'm aware of says that uh, women are, are well represented in life science fields and less so in physical and chemical and earth science fields. That was older. I'm hoping it has changed, but that was kind of the, no, it hasn't, okay. <laughs> but that was, you know, that was kind of the conventional wisdom, but maybe we're getting better. Um, yes, I do think it is definitely changing because, for example, at University of New England, where I am, a majority of the marine science undergrads is predominantly female. Um, like my past lab science that I had, I was the only male in the class. So it is definitely changing. Good. Any, anything else people would like to, to get inside information on? Yes, ma'am. The, the, there are two programs. The question is, if the cost is zero to the program, what does a scholarship pay for? There's the Keller Bloom program, which is what these, these folks have participated in. Then there's a Keller scholarship, which, which is separate. So students who are, who are off at university who want to apply for extra money as a scholarship, that's, that's apples and oranges. This is a high school program for high school juniors. This is for students who are in college who are looking for additional money to help pay those extravagant, you know, those high, high prices in universities these days. So they're different programs. So this, this program is, is free except for feeding 16 kids three times a day, which is, you know, pretty expensive. Oh, yes, good, thank you. Good. Circumstances of this program. As, as uh, somebody who uh, uh, just participates in society at, at large, I'm disturbed by, by uh, some of the, the, the ignorance that prevails. Uh, for example, just to pick one example, uh, 
There was a story last week in the, in the Booth Bay Register about a new energy uh, system that's being installed to uh, alleviate the uh, power problems we have here on the peninsula. And, the, uh, and it was described as a, uh, five, uh, a, a 500 kilowatt per hour system. And uh, that's like describing So I would characterize the question as the general scientific and mathematical literacy of the population and its rather deplorable state at present, but, but ways you're going to improve it because you're young and can do it. So <laughs> please, go for it. What, you got it? What do you got? Ah, Leanne, thank you for taking the mic. Um, so that's a great question, and it's a it's a challenge. And so I, you know, as as a scientist and someone who thinks that it's part of my duty to um, to educate and to convey what what I've what I do to the greater public, I, I take that pretty seriously. And so I, um, you know, I try to participate in any outreach opportunities that I can get my hands on. And so, you know, they're mostly marine science related, right? And they're through, um, you know, using Bigelow as an avenue to pursue that. But so for, you know, one thing that I'm doing, so the fellowship that I talked about a minute ago that is trying to work with underrepresented groups in science, I was awarded that and we'll start it in March. And so one thing that I'll be doing is working with Somalian populations in Lewiston who may have never, you know, seen the ocean or have looked through a microscope or anything like that. So I take that challenge pretty seriously. And so I hope through those types of activities, I will be able to educate a group of students that, um, you know, may never have, have learned about this type of stuff before. So I hope that helps answer your question. So it's really, for me, it's about just taking those opportunities that I'm given to educate young students seriously and like I said, try and do, um, do my best and work with them and take it, you know, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, really grab a hold of every opportunity that I can to educate them. Uh, similar thing, just being able to educate them as much as you possibly can because that's gonna be really the only way to solve that problem and maybe even trying to figure out ways that more of the teachers within their own school systems will be able to convey that message to the students. Um, but once again, it's hard to tell whether that would happen or not. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you know, society is not really helping us in this regard either. With, with Barbie saying math is hard, that sends a, that sends a rotten message to young people. And, and we need to we need to have more experience with orders of magnitude. I mean, this, this is an important concept and, and makes, makes a big difference. And so to have that basic number line understanding is, is important to, to follow dimensional analysis such that you can at least you know, track those units and perhaps then the, the, the metric you're, you're following is, is, is important as well. And in that regard, I, I want to I just take a little time to give you some, some, some math experiences here. And recognizing that, you know, about 
10% is, is in effect size in, in the social science world is, is a big thing. 10% is a big thing. So here's, here's the question that I want you to deal with in a little group that you're in. You figure out what the group is. But, but people around you, I'm going to put this question out and then we're going to, then we're going to have a discussion about it quickly. This, this deals with mentoring, and we've kind of we've gone about mentoring in in a very in a variety of ways here. You know, Leanne talked about mentoring that she's doing as 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 working with the Bloom students. Uh, Briar is was working through his program, mentoring in essence. It, it is like educating. It it tends to be longer term, but we're going to use mentoring in a big sense here. And you know, Bigelow, 40 years of mentoring. If you look back in those early days where you know, some of us were, well, not some of us, but there were high school students there who were you know, cleaning out test tubes and learning what it was to be a scientist. And, and that it isn't just all you know, glory, go to conferences and give papers, but there's a lot of, a lot of work behind it. That, so mentoring it writ large is where I'm going to go with this. So here's the question. And, and this is going to be hard because it's percent, OK? What is the percent difference between at-risk youth who had a mentor and planned to enroll in college and an at-risk youth who did not have a mentor? Remember, 10% is, is a big effect size. So what, what percent difference do you think there is in those two populations? Have a little talk with your, with your neighbors, and, and we'll see what, what you think. What's the value of mentoring, in essence? Here's, here's the question again. Here's the question. What is the percent difference between at-risk at youth who had a mentor and planned to go to college and at-risk youth who did not have a mentor, but plan to go to college. What, what was the difference in those two populations? At-risk youth are typically students who are reading well below grade level and, and don't have a supportive environment that tells them this education is important. So at-risk, at it's a pretty big population, unfortunately, in this country. So what's the percent difference in those two groups? Okay, you have two minutes, and I'm going to call the question. It's like being town moderator. I could do this. Okay, remembering that an effect size of 10% is pretty big. What's the percent difference between those two groups of at-risk youth, at youth who plan to go to college and had a mentor at-risk youth plan to go to college but did not have a mentor. What's, what's the difference in those populations? What, what do you think? 50%. How much? 50. 50. 50's huge. 40. 80. 80. Oh, 80. 80. Wow. <laughs> Who are we bidding on here? Well, you, you, uh, you expect a lot. There's actually, according to the social science research, there's a 25% difference in those two groups. So one group is 75% and the other group is 48%. So, so the value of a mentor increases your, your percentage that much. Here's, here's your next question. What is the percent difference between at-risk youth, we use the same definition, who had a mentor and regularly participated in a sports team, club, or other extracurricular activity versus an at-risk youth who did not have a mentor or participate in a at-risk and in a club. <laughs> I mean, is it a teacher? 
you know, typically, typically in, in the mentor literature, think of big brother, big sister. So kind of a regular opportunity to interact with a person who's older and has more experience and wisdom. But not a teacher. But not a teacher. Usually not a teacher. But absolutely, I mean, <laughs> yes. Sure. Sure, Jeannie, absolutely. And we would hope that they would be, but but in the in the social science research, they, they do differentiate these groups. So the what what percent there participate in something and out of school with a mentor or do not participate out of school? Another twenty five percent. Pardon me? Another twenty five percent. Twenty five percent. Good. Sixty five. Sixty five. All right. Somewhere between 25 and 65, it, it actually goes up to 30 percent. So again, you know that after school, that extracurricular activity with the mentor, really increases a kid's chance of getting out of that at-risk population. Mentors perform a very important function in this in this role, and and thank you know thank goodness that Leanne and and Breyer are heading down that road, but the but the research is clear that that. Internships, mentorships, apprenticeships, whatever you call them, that opportunity where a young person has a chance to, to have a, an adult relationship, to, to talk to the researchers and use their first name, which is another finding that we find in the evaluation, is a critical thing for these students because they haven't had that before. It's, it's always been their teacher who they've had to be very formal with, but, but now they're operating in more of a peer environment. and that that really supports and provides confidence for them. So with that, I'm going to, and, and David. Diet Tom. Diet Tom. Can you get his autograph? <laughs> So with that, I, I want to I thank David for, for bringing in these, these, uh, this, this field trip experience that he's, he's had and, and showing us throughout the, throughout the thing. Thank Leanne and Breyer for, for being willing to, to be the, the participants here. And, and you know, of course, thank, thank Bigelow for having, so far, 40 years worth of, of activity in the, in the science community and the local community and international community and 25 years going on more in, in the Keller Bloom program. And uh, maybe if I didn't mention it, you know, this is locally funded, so thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but with that, I'll turn it over to Graham.